So, uh, no, I'm Pastor Sean. Uh, Pastor Jason is actually ministering at downtown today, so I get the honor of, of ministering here today. Um, I am going to be the campus pastor of Northwest. Anybody excited about Northwest? Yeah. Me too. It's going to be a good time. So we got that coming up, um, but let's recap on what we talked about the last couple weeks. So two weeks ago, we brought up this teaching, the Holy Spirit. And so some of you guys know, been here for a while, you know that we usually come up with some fancy, cool names, right? Like Summer at the Movies, uh, that's not that fancy, but we come up with cool names, right? Something catchy, right? So we thought about this one, really, it is what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. And so the whole point is we want to kind of get rid of this um, religious tone with it, or sometimes just the sound of it. Sometimes people get a certain connotation. Let's squash that, right? And so week one, we did just that. We talked about that the Holy Spirit isn't like a, a name to be scared of, the Holy Ghost, right? Some people hear the Holy Ghost. It's like, hey, man, I just feel like the Holy Ghost is coming on you. They're like, hey, no, we ain't. Get him off me. What ghost, right? No, it's not to be scared of what it means. It's just like a gust of wind, right? A, a God wind in your life or a, or a breath in your life, right? And then week two, we talked about gifts. And we said that when the Spirit comes, it equips you with your gift, and whatever gift you're given, you got to do it for others, right? And so the cool thing about that, the thing that I love about Discovery, is we taught on it, and then right afterwards, we had that next step class to kind of talk about your gifts, finding your gifts, operating your gifts, and we had more than double show up for that, so that's exciting for you. Give yourself a round of applause, because what it means and what I love about it is you guys don't just hear it and forget it, you guys hear it and do something about it, right? And that's good. That's what Discovery is about, so that's awesome. So today, what we're talking about why Pentecost, right? So we're just, we're really trying to squash all this religious connotation with a lot of things you guys hear. And sometimes when we hear the word Pentecost, it's like a terrifying thing, right? Some people who know a little bit, they're like, oh man, he's going to be talking about snake charming and swinging on the chandeliers. No, that's not today, right? We're really going to squash a lot of that um, and bring up why Pentecost is relevant to your life, okay? So let's look at our theme verse. It's Acts 19, 1 and 2. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Uh, we've touched on this. Disciples means a student. So they were studying. They knew Jesus. They knew who he was. And they studied him and followed him. And so it's not like just some stranger, some random person who doesn't know anything. It's somebody who, who has followed Jesus. And he asked them, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And did you receive it? And they answered, nah, like... <laughs> No, they even said, they said, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Like, we don't know nothing about that. And that's what we're getting rid of at Discovery. Y'all don't have this excuse anymore. We're going to give you as much information about the Holy Spirit as you can, and you guys are going to be running with it. Amen? Amen. So again, we're going to be talking today about Pentecost. What Pentecost was is a Jewish celebration, okay? And the reason why we're emphasizing it is because uh, we, don't, we don't know these things. When you guys became a Christian or if you're n new to Discovery, you don't know all the Jewish traditions, all the Jewish celebrations that they had. So let's bring up why they're relevant and why they should mean something to you. Because if you're a Jew, you knew all about them because you celebrated it year after year and it was just like a part of life. So Jewish tradition, they had like seven celebrations. What do we typically do when we celebrate? We eat, right? We eat like crazy. So the Jews, that was their thing. They didn't have like seven, seven celebrations. They called them seven feasts. It's like, they love to eat, right? We can all understand that, right? When we get together, we love to eat. And so there were seven major feasts for the Jews, but there were three that really were vital to their beliefs, to what they were, and they were like really kind of hardcore ones, right? Like, like we have Elephant Day, but it's not really celebrated, right? But then we got Christmas, and that one's really celebrated, right? You guys understand what I'm saying? So they had three, which were their major ones. Um, and so we want to look at what we might not understand that they mean, and why it's relevant to us. And it says in Acts 2.1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came. And so sometimes for us, right, when we're reading this, um, assuming we read the Bible, right, when we read this, we read it, and we just jump right over it, right? Because it, I mean, honestly, if you don't know anything, it really means nothing, right? It's just the day of Pentecost. Okay, next, right? But what we want to point out is there's some relevance here. There's something happening, and there's a reason why they're bringing up that this is all happening on the day of Pentecost. So, it really stems from this concept, this underlying factor, and that's Matthew 5, 17. So this, for me, was a scripture that I wrestled with, when, and, and honestly, I did for a long portion of my Christian faith. It says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. And for me, that freaked me out. 
So I'm like, oh no. So those things all pertain. Like the, I still got to do all those crazy things that they do. But it says the next thing it says, I have not come to abolish them or to get rid of them or just say that they're not relevant anymore. No, no, no. I came to fulfill them. Okay, let me rephrase that for you. Do not think that I've come to continue to allow the incomplete because that was a life of incomplete. It's never going to work. Every year after year, you're going to continue to have to go back and sacrifice again and again and again. He said, no, no, no. Don't think I've gotten rid of that. Don't think you, that that's not relevant. No, no. Instead, I have come to make it complete, right? I have come that all of this that you guys have been doing, all this stuff that you guys have, fulfilled, like, have been worrying about and doing every single day, don't think I'm just here to cast it aside and say, forget about it. No, no, no. I'm here to just fulfill all of it. Amen? So let's look at how we fulfilled these celebrations. So Passover. A little bit of history on what Passover was. Passover, um, if you guys don't know, for a while the Jews were kind of, uh, well not kind of, they just straight up were, they were enslaved to the Egyptians. And so for a while things were working out okay for them, but then after a while things started getting serious and more serious and more serious to the point to where they're hardly surviving cracking whips. These guys are working day in, day out. A lot of them are dying. They're starving. They're hungry. They got nothing. They're in bondage. There's nothing they could do about it. And so God goes, burning bush, tells Moses, go let him go. Moses, after a long argument, decides to let him go with his buddy Aaron, goes there, basically tells Pharaoh, like, hey, man, do me a favor. Let him go. Pharaoh's like, no. And then Moses and Aaron are like, well, God's got some really bad things in store for you, so this stuff's going to happen. But then to the Jews, he said, sacrifice an unblemished lamb and put that blood on your doorpost, right? The wooden doorpost, put it on there. And what that meant is that the angel that's doing all this stuff is going to pass over their house and not bring that destruction to them, okay? So after that all happens, we know the rest, that they're redeemed, they're taken through, they pass through the sea, and then they're left in wilderness, right? But the key there, the key there is this concept of of the blood on there, the Passover, and that's what they celebrate day to day. What we want to look at is what that means for us today. So the first thing, what it was, the Passover lamb sacrificed at 9 a.m. The lamb was put in the oven at 3 p.m., and that sacrifice covered their sins, right? That was what they did year in, year out. There's a tradition to it. This is how you have to do this. This is how it must be done. It was a very strict law to how these things all take place. Well, let's take a look at the fulfillment. Jesus was sacrificed, It says at 9 a.m. It says Jesus was put in the tomb at 3 p.m. And we all know that Jesus' sacrifice is what removes our sin. Do you see it? He didn't just come and say, do away with Passover. That's not relevant anymore. He said, no, 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 I am Passover. It's upon me. I am fulfilling it. In 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, it says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So Christ is our lamb. Christ is the reason why. We can get past all this, and it's, it really means Passover. What it means for us is Passover is salvation. Okay, Passover is our salvation. And it's funny because this is a part of your Christian experience that's almost not like anything else. This part, it's totally free, right? I mean, it's one of the most important parts, but it's completely free. There is nothing you could do. There is no way that you could purchase this. There is nothing that you could do to earn this. This all comes down to this concept of merely accepting the fact that Jesus did, for you, did this for you. Amen? All this is, is it's freely given. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I think it says it beautifully. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved. By grace. By my works? Nah. By the things I do day to day, by the way I raise my kids, by the way I am to my wife. No, those are all good things, though. Good things, mostly. Right? But it's by grace that I have been saved. It says, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Say that for me. Say, this is not from who? Yourself. Same from you. It is the gift of God. How many of you guys have ever been given a gift with like a string attached? Right? How many of you guys ever got a birthday gift, and then when that next person's birthday came up, they're like, hey, I got you a birthday gift. Right? right? We're used to those kind of gifts. It's not that kind of gift. It's a free, free gift. It says, not by works. And I love the reason why. This is the reason why. It says, so that no one can boast. Do you have any, do, I mean, do you have anything to boast about when it comes to your salvation, the reason why you're making it to heaven? 
Not one bit whatsoever, right? I would love... I'd love to see somebody walk up to heaven's gates and be like, all right, let me tell you why I should be here and start listing out the reasons why. And we all know just sin is death, right? It just is what it is. It's like, no, 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 let me, no, 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 you didn't know. So you didn't know, Sean. Sean did some cool things. Let me tell you about it. No, it just boils down to the fact that what we could do is walk up there and say, I, I believed your son is the reason why I could come in, right? Come on in, amen? Amen. So the next thing, that's Passover. The next big celebration was Pentecost. Pentecost, this freaky word, right? This crazy word. Let's break it down a little bit. Let's, let's kind of a, get rid of this fear that we have. So, so the word pent, right? It's going to get deep and heavy here. It means five. That means five. And then cost, that means times 10. So Pentecost means 50. Yeah, anticlimactic, isn't it? Like, what? You told me this was going to be deep. No, it just means 50. That means there's nothing to be freaked out about when people talk about celebrating Pentecost or when people bring up the word Pentecost or Pentecost or all the above. Man, it's 50. It's a number. Relax. We'll be all right. But what it means for us, see, the word ain't scary, but what it means, and what it means ain't scary either. So they were celebrating Mount Sinai. If you're not familiar with Mount Sinai, so basically they come out, we see the rescue of Passover, and they come out, and they wander the wilderness for 40 days. They're just wandering around. And then Moses gets called up to this mountain for a cool 10 days, and they're all chilling down there. But again, they're young. They don't know. They, they barely got to know Moses, so you can imagine that they're having a little bit of loyalty issues. So they start doing some crazy stuff. But while Moses is up there, God creates the Ten Commandments, right? And then he gives them to Moses, then Moses takes the cam- Ten Commandments down, and then that's what we celebrate. That's what Pentecost is, is basically the uh, up, obtaining of the Ten Commandments, okay? So let's look at how that's fulfilled. First, what it was, a cloud descended with loud noise and fire. In the mountains where Moses was, we know that. God wrote his law on tablets of stone, Ten Commandments. And then when he came down, I told you there were people doing some crazy stuff. Well, because of the crazy stuff they were doing, 3,000 people died. 3,000 people died. I mean, that's incomplete, right? We all know. Anybody here following the Ten Commandments day in, day out, and you got nothing to worry about? That's incomplete, ain't it? We're not going to be able to do that. Let's look at completion. It says, the Holy Spirit descended down with loud sound and fire. Sound familiar? It said, and we know this, God wrote his law where? On our hearts, right? And then check this out. This is where God trips me out every time. 3,000 people got saved. It says the number. 3,000 people got saved. Do you see fulfillment there? See, sometimes we look at things, it's like it's coincidence. We breeze right over that. I can't tell you, these are God incidents, right? I mean, it's, no one else could script it this way. We just have to look at it. And, and sometimes I look at it when somebody tells me like, oh, you know, God ain't real. Christianity ain't real. It's simple things like this that I just look and be like, no, dude. <laughs> like, let me tell you, there are some crazy things out there that you can't plan like, you can't, you can't time that. You can't time. He had no control of the 9 a.m., 3 p.m. Jesus didn't control that. That happened, right? But these are God incidents laid out. You can't control exactly how many people, right? But these are God incidences, right? These are crazy things that happen. We got no control of, man. God is real, and God does things like this in our life every day. Acts 1, 3 through 5, he says, After his suffering, this is Jesus, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Sound familiar? 40 days, how long they were wandering in the wilderness, and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John was baptized, or John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it trippy? right? The stuff that God sets up, the stuff that God is able to do, it's unbelievable because, again, they can't set the tone. So they've been wandering around. I mean, if, could you imagine being a disciple and you've just lived the last three years of your life and you've dedicated everything to this man, right? And then he's crucified, dies, and you think you're hopeless, but then he's resurrected and you're tripping out like, what in the world? And then he just keeps showing up for like 40 days. I mean, how much would just sit there like, what do I even do with this? Right? Like, what, what is the next step? What is it that's something I could do? And Jesus says, okay, okay, like, I get you. Do me a favor. Hold up. Wait here in Jerusalem, and then something's coming for you. Right? 
Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So check this out. When he tells them to wait in Jerusalem, I'm going to forward the story in case you guys didn't know. 50 days later on Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit comes down, gives them that gift, gives them the spirit within them, and then they start walking in the spirit. So we talked last week about how the gifts, right? God gives you gifts so that you could serve like Jesus. So a long time ago, there was the moment when Moses goes up on the mountain, he comes down with the Ten Commandments, right? And the Ten Commandments, whether you know it or not, they really boil down to kind of two laws, which was love God and love your brothers. Don't murder each other. Don't covet your neighbor's wife, right? These are all rules and ways. Really, it was just a way for you guys to learn how to get along with one another in this new life and this new journey we're going to have together in the forward to the promised land, right? So how does Jesus fulfill that? Man, it's next level kind of stuff, right? Because now what we're talking about is the 50 days after. Now we're actually given the Spirit. And what the Spirit does is it tells you how to live among one another. And what that is, is serving one another, reaching one another through the Spirit's power. It's, again, God takes the incomplete and makes it complete and fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Let's take a look at Pentecost is the power to make a difference. And we're going to really dive into that later. Pentecost is the power to make a difference. The next celebration they had is the Tabernacles, Feast of the Tabernacles. So tabernacle is a fancy way to say tent. It's like a fancy tent, temporary living. And so in these times, during this celebration, they would actually go out, create a tabernacle, and they would just kind of live in there for a bit just to remind themselves of the real celebration, which was 40 years or a long time earlier, for 40 years, they were just roaming the wilderness in these tabernacles. How many people here are under 40 years old? How many people under 40, under 40, under, some of y'all lying. I see you. I'm just kidding. Under 40 years old. So could you imagine like it would be your whole life. You never had a real home. You just moved from place to place to place to place every single day. And then finally, after 40 years, you find the promised land. That was, that was what they lived through in those times. And that was what they were trying to remember when they celebrated tabernacles, that they would go out there and they would remind themselves of this 40 years that they were out there in the wilderness, just basically going, you know, I mean, what else can you do in a desert? What can you do in a desert, especially when every single day you have to go somewhere, but you're not going anywhere? Do you imagine that life? It's like, all right, um, Fred, where are we going to go today? <laughs> just pick a rock, right? Like, at this point, it's been 40 years. We're just roaming around. Just pick a rock and we'll go set up there, right? 40 years they did that. So let's talk about how Tabernacles was completed. First, they were wandering and living in temporary huts. They were brought to their final home, and they celebrated during the harvest season. You can see some of y'all already getting it. See, because Tabernacles is what we live in, in today. Let's take a look. We are living on this temporary earth in our tabernacle body. We will be brought to our final home in heaven. Amen. And there will be a great final harvest of people. So some of you guys don't know, but we are living in one of the craziest harvest seasons that the world has ever seen. In the last, since, let's just take a look at it from the year 2000. From the year 2000 and before, compared to from 2000 till present day, there have been more salvations just in these last 18 years than there was in the 2000 years previous. I'm telling you, we're living in a great harvest. It's a harvest generation. So does that mean Jesus is coming back? Maybe. Absolutely. But it's not something that should scare you. It's something that should prepare you. That this is something you need, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. Let's look at it. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Amen? So we will be with the Lord forever. That is a day that we got to be excited about, not a day that we're constantly scared of. Amen? So Tabernacles is the second coming of Christ. So Tabernacles is where we're living now. We're in a wilderness, right? 
Some of you guys ain't got no direction to go, and you're living just like that. Fred, where are we going today? I don't know, that place over there might as well, right? I got nowhere else to go. We're going to change that today. So those were just some of the feasts that we focused on just to give you ideas of how Jesus basically made these laws, these old ways of living, and how he fulfilled them. But let's talk about why Pentecost is so important to your life. Acts 2.12 I mean, we got fear. It says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? That's them after like the Holy Spirit shows up and they're just like, what does this mean? If you could imagine like you had this whole lifestyle laid out before you, you knew what you were supposed to do the next day. You know the sacrifices, the day you make them, what you do on Saturday, what you do on Sunday, what you don't eat on Monday, what you should eat on Tuesday, right? Your whole life is mapped out. And then you're given this kind of new life, this new concept. And then the Holy Spirit shows up, and they're just in there like, what does this even mean, right? It's simple. It's simple. Jesus came, set the tone, so that you can have power. The power of the Spirit. So the first thing we talked about, again, was that the Spirit is a breath of fresh air. It's a breath of life. It's a breath of God. It's the wind of God. Right? It's not something to be scared of. It's not something to be freaked out about. And then we talked about that through this, through this change and through that, you're going to get the gifts of God to help you serve others. And you're going to be able to move on and do those things. This is make no mistake about it. God needs you to possess his power in your life in a supernatural and great way. And he wants to empower you in these areas. And the first one is the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to live righteously wants to empower you to live righteously. Pentecost celebrated the day that the law was given to the Jews in the wilderness, right? That's what was celebrated. And some of us are still trying to live a life like they were living then. Some of us are still caught up in this concept of living day to day, following certain rules, following certain rituals. What do I got to do? What am I not supposed to do? Caught up. And, and I mean, I, I look at it like this. It's like some of us are still living like this and, and where it's like God has called you on a journey and you're so freaked out about what could possibly happen about your right and your wrongs. You're so caught up in this concept of being good and doing things right that you just kind of every time that you feel like you need to go somewhere, God's calling you to do something, you just do it so hesitantly. And you're so scared. Oh man, am I, I going to mess up? Am I going to do this wrong? Am I going to do that wrong? And you just go, oh, okay, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I have no balance. So I'm like falling over. So you're looking at it, you're just saying, okay, what's the next step? And you're so scared and still so caught up in this concept of right and wrong. And some of us honestly have never taken a step forward because we still just sit there constantly saying like, well, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do this wrong or still beating themselves up because guess what? They sinned or still beating themselves up because they can't stop doing this or stop doing that. It's not about that. It's a, when you get the spirit, it's going to show you how to live righteously. And the way that happens is because, again, no longer is the law written on stone tablets. The law is written on your heart. So you don't have to live like this, constantly looking at, am I doing this right? And kind of checking it by things that you've heard, checking it by things that you see and kind of trying to balance all this. No, no, it's in your heart. So just live. Like, just move. Just follow what you feel inside. Follow what the heart is telling you. Follow what the Spirit was telling you. Because then you don't have to get caught up in all these laws and all these rules and all these regulations. And am I supposed to do that? Am I supposed to eat a pig on a Saturday at 4 p.m.? I don't remember. Right? It's not about that. It's past that. Romans 8 and 9. It says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. How many of us are still controlled by that sinful nature? Right? Still just living in day in, day out, struggling, fighting that same old battle over and over again. Because the sinful nature feels good, right? If we're being honest. We don't keep going back to sinful nature because it's annoying, right? It feels good at the time. That's why we keep doing it. We all know those things. Those things we don't like to talk about, those things, that sinful nature. So it says right here, how you get out of it. If the Spirit of God lives in you, that's the only way you can no longer be controlled by that sinful nature. You got to understand that. So if you're sitting there and you're saying, I'm in that boat, man. I'm just standing still. I'm not going anywhere. I, I just keep beating myself up, keep living in this concept that I'm not doing right. I'm not good. I'm not doing right. I'm not good. I keep screwing up. I keep living in my sinful nature. Then again, day in, day out, don't expect it to change unless you've got the spirit power inside of you, right? Because you're just living in the status quo. How else is it going to change? See, we got to change this concept. So a lot of us, we live in this kind of idea that we got to check certain things off the list, right? 
So if I'm a good Christian, then I better make sure that one, I attend church, two, that I volunteer for something, three, that I don't cuss, and four, right? We got our lists, we got our lists, check them off, and then that means I'm a good Christian, right? And so we live our lives just constantly saying like, okay, I have to make sure, right? Like, okay, I have to make sure that I'm there today, or I have to make sure that I do this today, I have to make sure I do that today. See, when the Spirit's inside of you, when it's on your heart, when it's what you live by, it changes to, I want to. But even further, can I tell you something further that happens? You even change the connotation of the have to. It's like your life blood inside of you just desires for you to do these things, and there's nothing you could do about it. So now instead of saying, oh, I have to go to church today because otherwise I don't check that off my box. No, no. Now it's, oh, my gosh, I have to go to church today. Like I have to be there. Dream Center is doing something out there. I don't have to go there. No, I have to be there because God is going to do something amazing out there, and I have to be a part of it. It changes the connotation of how you live. So no longer are you caught up in this concept of this. No, you are running full speed saying, man, what, where are you taking me next, God? What does this mean for me now? Where are you going to move me now? It's a different way of thinking. Let's look at Isaiah 30, 21. And this should help you guys on this whole concept of, am I doing right? Am I doing right? Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Walk in it. It doesn't say this is the way. Hold up. This is the way. Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? What are you doing? Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. This is the way. You just walk. And it says whether you're going to go left or right, it says don't fret about it because you go right. It's going to be like, no, this is the way. Okay, my bad. That's it. You ain't got to be so freaked out about it. I hear so many people like, Sean, I don't know. I don't know what God's called me to. I don't know where I should go. I don't know what I should do. There's like some very simple things, man. Get that God spirit inside of you. You ain't got a choice because you're just going to have to. It's just a part of who you are. I remember in my life, a time that the Spirit spoke to me and I just wasn't ready for it. It was like that whisper in my ear. I said, hold up, right? And I should have been ready for it. So we're at a convention, and, and John Eldridge, one of my favorite authors, he's, uh, he's talking to us and he's telling us, so many of us live so much that we, stop, we forget to stop and hear what, what the Spirit's telling us, right? So at this time in my life, uh, I, had, I had done a lot in the church. I was a part of it, but now I was pulling away. There was just a ton of drama, and I was so sick of it, right? We got, we've been there, done that. So, uh, so at this time, I, I was just in a stage of my life where I'm just kind of, I'm going. And so me and Eris, we go to this convention. We're sitting there. And he says, what's the Spirit telling you? I'll never forget it. Eris looks over at me, and he's emotional because what he says is, is God's just telling me he loves me. I said, oh, that's so good, man. That's so good. He's like, what's God telling you? I said, yeah, God told me to quit my job. <laughs> and he's like, what? I said, yeah. Can we switch? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, you know, I know God loves me. I know that's not like that. That's not, it wasn't that. It was just that I knew that it was just there. And I, and I was so happy with where I was, right? I was so content in my job because I was good at it. I was very good at it. And I was being promised all these promotions. And my manager was telling me, man, I got this. So there's something coming up and, and we're going to get you in there and you're going to be working more hours. You're going to be making more money. We're going to set you up. It's going to be good, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, all right, sounds good. So now I got to show up to work and try to explain this. So a couple days go by until my next shift, and I show up, and the manager says, hey, come into my office. I got, some, I got something to tell you. And I said, ooh, I got something to tell you too. <laughs> so we get called into the office, and she goes, let me go first. And I said, okay, you go first. She goes, you got the job. You're promoted. I said, cool. I should have gone first. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, I got to quit my job. And she goes, what? And, I, and the whole time I was wrestling with the concept, because I knew the question would be, Why? Right, the why, the why. And, and in my head, I thought, how can I possibly explain any other reason why? So I had to tell her. I said, is it because I feel like God is telling me that. I feel like the Spirit's telling me that. And she goes, I don't know what God you're listening to. And I said, I don't know either right now. <laughs> I don't know. I just know this is what I'm told. Can I tell you, two weeks later, like the last day of my job, all that drama I was talking about that I was running away from, it all came out, all of it. And there were so many broken people, so many lost people, and so many hurting people. And I remember the pastor just came to me and said, I don't know what you're doing, but I need you here. And I said, guess what? I'm not doing anything, right? So sometimes the Spirit will just speak to you like that. I'll tell you right now, I was just walking, and I mean, I wasn't asking left or right. <laughs> I wasn't asking nothing. I was just walking. And then basically he said, stop and listen to what God's telling you. And God's like, hard left. <laughs> oh, Fair enough, right? And so don't worry so much about just always like, oh, I can't take a step unless I know. No, just move. And that voice will just direct you when it's time, when it's ready. Because if I'd have done it any earlier, I wouldn't have been ready. If I'd have done it any later, they would have missed out. 
So just move and do your thing, and the Spirit's going to move on you. Amen? Second one. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live supernaturally. Oh, I love that word, supernaturally. How many of you guys love living naturally? Cool, that's about the, expa- the, the, that's the response I explained. How many of you guys are tired of living life naturally? Hey, my man Captain America is, right? See, I'm so tired of living naturally. I'm ready to live supernaturally. I brought my Captain America socks today, amen? It's time that we get out of this concept of, of, of what I can do. And if we want to live supernaturally, it means I got to have the Holy Spirit within me. It's just, it, it's a must. Because the thing is, is Sean can only do so much. Like, that's it. There's a limitation. Sean is going to cap out. Sean's going to hit a lid. When I said that this morning in the 8 a.m. service where my wife was, she said amen so fast, right? Because she knows Sean's limitations. Sean ain't much of him. You know, he ain't much by himself. He can't do much. But the thing is, when God steps in, when the supernatural, when the Holy Spirit steps in, we're taken to a whole nother level that we never expected. And more often than not, the reason why you haven't held up a supernatural is because you're the one trying to enclose God and the Spirit. And you're the one kind of sitting on it and saying, God, like, I know I'm broken. I know that my body, the doctors told me I'm going to die. I know that the, the doctors told me that I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life. The doctor told me that this is it. And so in my natural, there's nothing I could do about it. Can I tell you, there is supernatural. Like, he ain't dead. The physician didn't die. You have a supernatural inside of you that's just ready to take aim and take on the fight for you. So if you're looking at your family, you're saying, there is no way my brothers and sisters are going to get saved. Sean, there's no way I could tell you you're right unless you bring in the supernatural. If you're telling me there's no way, Sean, there's no way I could break this addiction. I fought it for the last 20 years of my life. There's just no way. You're right because you're fighting it naturally. You need to bring in the supernatural. You need to start living by the Spirit and quit living on this concept of what you can do because, again, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be disappointed in yourself. It just is what it is. And a lot of times when you live around those depressed Christians that just don't know a way how they could do it, they're constantly sad and open and depressed. It's because they're not living by the Spirit. They're just disappointing themselves because they're living by the natural. Amen? How many of you guys ready to live in the supernatural? Amen? (laughs) Acts 10.38. It says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. I could stop the whole sermon here. We're talking about why you guys need the Holy Spirit. I can answer it with this alone. Jesus needed it. Like if you're going to sit there and tell me I don't need it, I could do without. I'm fine where I am. I like being stuck in the rut. I don't want to be. No, 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 no. See, because when you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself Christ-like. That means you're trying to be like Christ. So I could tell you right now, if you're Christ-like, then guess what? You need the Holy Spirit. And the reason why you need it is then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Are you guys ready to start attacking those around you who are oppressed that the devil is coming after? Are you guys wanting to fight their battles? Amen? Amen. Then what do you need? You need the Spirit. It just is what it is. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. See, this is me right now. It says, my message and my preaching, they were not wise and with persuasive words. Man, I know Sean. Sean can come up here and crack jokes. That's all he's good at, right? Some of y'all are like, not really. <laughs> but, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. See, we can't, if you guys are showing up Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, and you just keep taking all these nuggets that Pastor Jason brings, right? And you keep taking these nuggets that sometimes Pastor Sean will drop every once in a while, right? And you just keep taking these things, and you're saying Sunday, 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 and you're just living off of those, just that information, just trying to get that wisdom. Guess what? You're in the rut. Because you're just living off of our, like, you're just trying to take information, live off of, no, 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 you need to start living off of the Spirit's power. And so when you get that, no longer are you just going to take in information. You're going to take in motivation, right? So that's the difference. That's what I'm talking about last week. You guys heard about the gifts of the Spirit, but some of you guys took it as motivation and said, well, then I got to find out what mine is. I got to do something about it. I got to show up to this next steps thing because apparently when the Spirit's on me, this is going to happen, right? Right. Last thing, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live on mission. Holy Spirit empowers me to live on mission. 
See, this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is where sometimes we miss it. Because a lot of us just keep getting more and more and more things. See, the thing is, I can't live on a mission for me. That's not a mission. That's just my life. You got to have a mission. That means you're doing something for someone else, right? So some of us have this concept that the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to make you just everything you wish you could be. That's not the case. The Holy Spirit came to put you on a mission so that you can help serve others. We've been talking all last week, we've been talking about this concept of God gave you these gifts, God's bringing the Spirit so you could serve like Jesus served. Did Jesus ever serve himself? No, Jesus went as far as he didn't even, he, he's the Son of God, he's God incarnate, and he shows up to this meal, and he looks, and everybody's got nasty, dirty feet. And he goes as far as to say, like, you know what? Let me wash those for you. Serving. Serving. Y'all got nasty feet, right? I mean, and they were wearing the old Jesus sandals, right? They were nasty. You know, they didn't have the toilet system we had. They just throw it out on the road. What are you walking in in those Jesus sandals? That's what Jesus was willing to just sit there and wash off. So when you're put on a mission, you're put on a mission to serve others. First Thessalonians 1 and 5, it says, Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Let me tell you something that's crucial to this. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. Put that in there. Put that in your notes. It don't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. See, there's there's something sometimes that happens with people when they get the Holy Spirit or when they start walking in this, and it kind of becomes, some people take like a nose up moment, right? Because you ain't got it. You don't see the things I see. But what all all I've ever seen in Jesus' ministry is the nose down moments, right? Who else is going to look at those nasty feet and think they need to clean them? right? You don't get this so you can start looking up and looking over people. You get it so you can start looking into people, right? And so the crucial things is it doesn't make you better than others. It makes you better than yourself. See, I remember I was on a mission trip, literally on a mission. There you go. I was, I was standing there and I'm looking out at a crowd and there's like 400 people. It's in Bolivia. And the leader comes to me and he says, you're going to lead this message. Now this is Sean right? I was just living as Sean at that time. I didn't know any better. I was Sean. So how did Sean handle it? Sean literally walked away and cried. Like I was scared out of my mind. I was 15 years old. I didn't know any better. I used to just sit in the back of a church with my hair moped down. I used to have long hair. I moped down over my face. Don't no one look at me. That was Sean. And so I got called into a moment when I had to start living by the spirit. I I looked at it and I said, this cannot be me. It's not me. This has got to be something better than me. And the spirit came on. I can't tell you. I don't remember what I said. I'm not saying like I blacked out. I don't remember what I said because that's not what's memorable. I remember the hands all over accepting Jesus. I remember the spirit moving. And I remember thinking right then, man, I'm 15 years old. And God could use the spirit within me to move like that. Never the same. And I'm telling you that whether you're 15, 12, 11, I don't care what age you are, 60, 70. When the spirit comes upon you, he's going to put you on a mission that makes you better than yourself. And can I tell you, I'm no longer okay with the excuse of, it's too freaky for me. Because the problem is, is that you guys have been called to do something and people are waiting for you to take it on. People are waiting for you to step into what God has called you for. They need you to step into it. Man, do you guys know the world is broken? Man, I've worked worked downtown. I work with different nonprofits around Kern County. And sometimes we look, we say Africa has problems. Asia has problems. Yeah, they do. But we have some serious problems here. And you guys could be that change if you're living a life that's better than you. You want to talk about human trafficking? It's happening right under our noses. You want to talk about hungry, poverty, brokenness. You want to talk about just people who don't know a thing about Jesus. That's all happening right under our noses. And we can't be okay with that. And we need somebody better than me. We talk every single week. Our mission love God, love each other. And then what? And we can't change the world. And we're living to, we're moving to step into the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so if we're saying this is our mission every single week, you guys are buying into it. Some of you newcomers like, man, I signed up for way more than I thought, right? No, the truth is we signed up to change the world. That means you have to do it through spirit's power because you have to be better than you because you're not going to be able to do it yourself. Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.